Alright, welcome everyone. Chef Mark here at Appliance Factory in my laboratory. And we're gonna do more butchering. Yes! Excellent. So everyone, if you've been tuning in the last week or two, I've been doing a lot of live videos, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm at right now, as you watch this, I'm at 954 subscribers, and I need a thousand subscribers to be able to start monetizing. Why is that important? Because I'm giving away all this free information. YouTube would be paying me ad rat. Of course, that's not why I'm doing it. Why I'm doing it is because I love to share cooking. Tips and tricks. I have, for many, many years, been teaching cooking, and I enjoy sharing my perspective and take on these things. And you know what? YouTube wants to pay me a little ad revenue while I'm at it, then so be it. Okay? Middle of the laboratory. I'm going to be sous vide these bad boys. If you, if you uh, watched last Friday where I was doing the strip loin, um, pardon me, ribeye, I uh, sous vide that and then that got roasted in a hot oven. We sliced it for an event over the weekend. It was really delicious and we saw tang mushrooms here in a little bit. I've got a big event coming up on Thursday and I'm out of town. Um, exciting. I'm going to Thermidor uh, Experience Center in Irvine, California. I haven't been in five years. So I'm going to check out what's new for 2023 and beyond, the appliances. I'll have a lot of hopefully some videos from that coming up for you guys to see. Um, so check my socials for information on that. I'm really excited. They do a great job. I love their appliances and I love their experience. Uh, Last time, the first time I went, it was all chefs, and I got to meet some really, really fantastically talented chefs, some very well known on a national stage, some who've done a lot of TV work, winners of various contests and shows. That was exciting. I don't know if this will have that same impact. I think I'm going to be working more with designers and salespeople this time. Um, but looking forward to seeing what 2023 has to offer. Okay, so uh, there's two sides to a tenderloin here. You have the tail, it's the thin side, and then you have uh, the head or the bull, that's the fat side. You have the top and you have the bottom. So the bottom, this is what attaches to the rib cage, and then this is the outside uh, face of the muscle. So the first thing I like to do is get rid of any of this loose fat. Let me see if I can get a little bit better angle here. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty extreme angle, but I like that. Okay, I'm working off a plastic cutting board just because it's a little bit more sanitary. Got my sharp boning knife here. And similar, here's the deal. It's all similar. Whether you're cutting a tenderloin or a strip steak or a ribeye or pork tenderloin or even chicken breast or if you're filleting fish, it really is all the same job. So you have, hello viewer, uh, you have an opportunity to learn working with a fillet knife anytime you're doing this kind of work. Okay, so what am I doing here? I am just getting rid of the low hanging fruit fat. So this stuff here, okay. It's called the chain. Chain's gonna be coming off here. Couple things you can do with the chain. I'll go over that here in a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna be doing two of these. I get about 25 people out of a tenderloin for uh, after I sous vide and then we carve them. The beauty about sous vide is you don't really lose any volume because uh, there's nowhere for the volume to render off into when you're sous vide. And then when you go ahead and add that sear, um, you know. Again, it's not really shrinking out of here. So what you see here is pretty much what I get. Okay, so take the chain off. Okay, and I just like to have majority of the chain off. It does get a little tricky down here. Uh, I never really have discovered a perfect solution for this, but I'll show you what I do. And if you were watching last week, I mentioned how, you know, I'm not a professional butcher. So I'm not here, I got a plastic bag for trash. Uh, I'm not here trying to show you, this is how the pros do it. This is how Chef Mark does it. And I do have some videos where some people who are professional butchers chime in and say, 
well, that's not the way, you know, the National Beef Council recommends cutting, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. But what I'm trying to do here is do something relatable to my audience. Okay, so there's a seam here. This is the chain. This is the bull. And there's a seam here. And I wish there was a more um, defined cut here because what you look, you actually have the meat going in two separate directions. This is going this way, this way, and this way. This is going this way. So you end up, if you're not careful, that you don't cut properly, you end up with a piece of steak that's going to be tough because the grain is going in two directions. So this is the chain. I'll come back to that here in a second. Okay. Now this silver skin, here's the trick. You come underneath, you pierce, you roll your knife up. Okay. Then I'm going to pull back with my right hand and forward, pardon me, back with my left hand and forward with my right hand. Then I reverse the operation. Okay. You just do that over and over again. Guys that are really good at this can do this in three, four swipes. You know what? I prefer to take my time. I'm when I'm butchering, butchering, and I'm cutting meat and I'm cutting a lot of meat. It's the only thing I'm worried about. I'm not searing off mushrooms. I'm not boiling potatoes. I'm doing nothing other than the task at hand. So oftentimes, I worked at a steakhouse uh, in uh, Parker, Colorado, um, and I would cut all the most of the steaks. Some, some steaks we brought in. I just, I'm just, that's a big glob. I don't care about that. And it's the first thing I would do. So I would come in every day before any of the cooks got there. I was there by myself and I would cut meat for two, three hours. So you know, I had the, really the place to myself. I might do a couple deep prep items, you know, we like the compound butter or, you know, start a stock or, you know, start the onion soup, things that were like kind of long, long cooking, but those were things that I could, you know, just kind of let them work. So move your work as opposed to moving. I like to stand still. This is a hard habit to get into. I like to stand still, but move my work so that my knife hits the same place every time. Okay. Yep. And you can use your fingers. It's fine. You know, you don't want to tear the meat, so if you're pulling with your hands and you start to tear the meat, stop. Okay, now I like to flip over and check out the back side. And this feathery fat, it could render off, and depending on how nice the steakhouse is, they might leave this on or take it off. I worked at a place where, I didn't quite work there. I worked around this place. I was using their kitchen for commissary for another place. Anyways, the chef was lazy, man. He would cut through the chain, through the silver skin, through the fat. He said, well, why would I trim it? Um, you know, I don't get as many steaks as if I trim it. And then I'm like, it's fatty and gristly. Well, that's the way our, our customers like it. Customers like shitty fillets? All right, dude. I mean, I know laziness when I see it. I wasn't the chef there, but if I was, I would rather do a light trim on a steak and charge more for a better quality. Okay. So you can go, you can drive yourself nuts trying to get a lot of this stuff off. This is a, this is twice. So it's not because I'm uh, sous being this, I can go down a, uh, from select the choice. And the flavor is going to be, flavor and tenderness is going to be there, but you do end up with some type of a little bit more waste. I had heard a fun challenge, and that's I should weigh one of these and then butcher it and then weigh it again and then have people guess how much it weighs. And the winner wins, I don't know, one of my fancy aprons or something cool. So maybe as I'm building my audience, I can do a, a giveaway in the future. That might be fun. So if you're watching this on rebroadcast and you hear that, let me know what you think. Okay. Uh, I don't know what this weighs beforehand. Probably find out. This one weighs 6.53 pounds. So somewhere in the six and a half pound range. Now, a couple of different ways you can handle this. So if I was cutting steaks, what I would do is this bit here that's really thin, I would cut off to about there. And then anything I have on this end, I would cut off to there. And I would take those two steaks and stick them next to each other wrap them with two pieces of bacon and call it a bacon wrap twin filet. 
So I'd have three ounces off this end and three ounces off this end, or even better yet, off the bull nose and bacon wrapped twins. So you can get one or two bacon wrapped twins for every filet. Um, and so if you're doing, I don't know, you're butchering five fillets, you know, you got 10 steaks there that were otherwise maybe be just for like steak salad. And then you're cutting center cuts. So you usually can get, mm, so, and then I would cut a couple petite fillets. So four ounce petites. Um, and then I would serve those either by the single or double and then you cost those out. And then you, center cut six ounce would be about that big. So it looks, I mean, that's a big gap for center cut six ounce, but you know, this is a thin cylinder. And then finally, this would be a chateau from here down. So I'm going to cut out this, um, silver skin here. This whole thing would get grilled and then carved center, uh, grilled and then carved center, um, center, what I'm saying, table side. So come on, use your worst mark. Table side, that would be more like a traditional style. Um, but if I wasn't going to do chateau, then I would go, I would get one more center cut out of that. I would get one well done center cut bull nose out of that, which I would end up having to butterfly because this is a less tender. And then the ends I would stay for steak salad or try to make twin, twin fillets out of it. If that makes sense. So I am going to take this bull off because we're going to sous vide that as well. So twin bacon wrap filet. Uh, it'd be uh, two six ounce medallions, pardon me, two three ounce medallions covered, wrapped in two one ounce pieces of bacon equals eight ounces. And then anytime it's interesting, anytime you have two pieces of protein sitting next to each other tight like that, the cooking time goes way up. Um, I don't know why. I, I'm not a thermodynamicist or whatever you would call that. Uh, but for whatever reason, and it, it always holds true, always, always holds true. You have to take two pieces of protein flat next to each other and cooking time 25 30 percent longer so we would never recommend a bacon wrap well done because it would just take forever forever and ever but you know you tell somebody they can't have it and then they want it so uh cooking time is extremely long but it's very nice and then you know maybe put a little bernay sauce on that or make an oscar a bacon wrap oscar would be very nice Okay, so here's my center cut. I am going to take this bowl off. And again, there's no super defined seam right here. I wish there was. So I just have to kind of guess. And when you're guessing, guess with confidence. That's going to help. Okay. So I am going to see so this and that. I'm just going to cut off these point ends here. So. Okay, so this and this, these two, okay, I'm going to get vacuum pack and, and uh, we're going to be those. Here, this is the chain. So again, I worked at a, that same crappy steakhouse. Here's what the chef would do. He would take this, he would just take his knife down and try to get rid of a little bit of this fat, just to slice them out. And then you would cut through the gristle, and then through the gristle, and then we would skewer this stuff and grill it and serve it. It's so gross. He did not want anybody cleaning it up like I'm going to do right now because he thought that was a waste of money. You're wasting the good meat. That's good meat. Chef, you're an idiot. All right. So actually this, this chain actually has a fair amount of meat on it. Um, so if you hate your customers or you hate your friends, then you cut this down into medallions by yay big and um, make a shish kebab with this stuff. And I've been to restaurants where I've gotten shish kebabs. I, I typically don't order shish kebab. Shish kebab for me means inconsistent cooking of both the vegetable and the meat and typically a garbage piece of meat like this. So I wouldn't order that. Um, but what you can do and what I'll do here is I'm going to roast this stuff off in an oven, add mirepoix, and then make a bouillon, a, 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 a meat-based stock. And I'll reduce that down and make some jus with this. Okay. But this part here, 
is actually pretty good. Okay. This part here, we can clean this up. You see that deep dark red right there where it's bloody? I'm gonna cut that out. I'm gonna cut that out. That's some bruising of the muscle, as I understand it. Curious to see if Thermodo is going to be offering sous vide in the oven. It's pretty cool. One of our vendor partners they have sous vide in the oven. So it creates steam. I know Mila does it, Signature Kitchen Suites. It'll create steam at a lower temperature, like 130, 125, 130 degrees. You vacuum pack and you put the whole thing in the steamer and you have a different way to sous vide. All right. So this guy here um, can't really grill and serve this. You're not going to get enough of these consistently. This one just happens to look like this. Um, you know, so what can you do with this? Well, this would be for beef tips, uh, to be honest with you. Um, you know, if you got three or four of these consistently, if, you, if you're if lucky that way, then what I would do would be to um, serve them uh, as a lunch steak, but you would want to cook it and then cut it and then put it on the plate. I wouldn't serve this as a whole muscle. I don't think you would be doing very well for your friends, family, customers, people you like. Um, just because there is some blind bristle and stuff through that. All right, so this guy here has been wet aging for a couple weeks now. This one I bought thinking I was going to need it for an event, but because it's in cryovac, um, you know, 30 days in cryovac, you can see it's much bigger. So this one's maybe less, less than six and a half. This is really big. Let's take a look here. The fat's different on it. I would say this one, it's got a nice beefy smell to it. If you're into that sort of thing, which I am. Okay. And this one I can tell it's been, been aging. So wet age. So you buy a filet. If I can, I buy my filets several weeks in advance of an event and then I just let them sit in my refrigerator and just they just get better they just get better dry aging dry aging a fillet is tricky because you lose so much uh, when you dry age something you really do need to cut off the age it's basically mold and you got to cut that off it's beneficial mold adds a lot of flavor but you lose a lot of volume so um, up to 50 percent of the weight that you started with and I mentioned in the last video, you know, butchers, we don't give this away. We weigh the weight before we start working, and then every ounce of usable then gets um, counted up. So I, and it's a sliding scale. So uh, a, a center cut filet, because I can only get three or four of those out of a steak, or not even two or three really, those are going to be more valuable than tips and bacon wrap twins. Last time I worked in a restaurant, a, I was selling center cuts for $28. Now this has been a while, so I, I don't know what the current pricing is, but I would sell a center cut for $28 and I would sell a bacon wrap filet for 20. So that's an $8 difference, right? Um, and I think our most expensive, to put, to put it in perspective, because it's been a few years, uh, maybe 10 years, um, when I was doing that kind of work and pricing stuff out, was oh maybe our most expensive steak was like a big ribeye that maybe like 35 bucks so you know 28 dollars was up there um and then by the time if you made it a surf and turf and you added a side and had a glass of wine or three you know it would be a hundred dollars you know uh, nowadays it'd probably be closer to 200 for that same meal so interesting here this is not very good quality so this came out of the packaging like this that's disappointing to see. That means whoever cut this off the primal did a shitty job. Yeah, and it's not really, can't really do anything with this. It's not the cow's fault, you know. Um, and if that happened to me in a restaurant, I would stop and I would send that back. The whole thing, I don't want this. Paid a lot of money for this filet. I don't want that. Um, but, but I guess, I mean, I got this from Restaurant uh, Depot, and they, they do a generally good job. So, but I don't, they're not producing this. They're getting it from their source. So, I guess if I wanted to make a stink over it, I could, but, you know, I'm not. 
but in a restaurant, I mean, that's that right there, that right there is the difference between making food cost some days and not. I'm serious about that. Rage, razor thin margins. Now, part of restaurants being far more expensive these days, part of that is because restaurants have started paying people what they're really worth. Now, when I look at this, when I was an executive chef at a restaurant, uh, not even that long ago, 10 years ago, the average salary for an executive chef in Colorado was $36,000 a year. That's not a lot of money. So now it's closer to 90. Um, and that's really more commiserate with what the job deserves to be paid because, you know, it's stressful. It's, you have to have a tremendous resource of experience and talent and people skills and math skills. You have to be creative. You have to have your head on a swivel. All it takes is just a couple days, a couple bad days in a restaurant food costs go through the roof, and you're fired. I'm kind of proud to say that I was working at a country club. I was a sous chef, and I left. Kind of got driven out. I was glad to leave there, but I left. And next month, the food cost went up 10 points, and it stayed there. I was, so, you know, that was, that's always been one of my unique talents. It's, um, I don't, couldn't really tell you how I was managing food costs. I just could. Um, you know, it's complicated and, you know, they say you're not truly an expert until you can describe something simply. So I don't know how much of an expert I was, but I had a feel for it. And um, yeah, so I'm getting like a lot of connective tissue here. This is not a very good piece of meat that I'm working with. There's that bull nose. So you can see this one's not as clean as the other one. And now that I've cleaned it up, look at that. Look at how this one and this one are so similar in shape. The barrel is almost identical. So this one has a lot more um, fat eyes on its chassis, to coin a term. Yeah, good. So, again, uh, you know what? I'm going to jump over to this. So these chains you can use for... We talked about that. There's not a lot you can do with it, but I'll tell you, when I was a young culinary and I was learning to butcher, the chef would throw me the chain and say, here, clean, clean these up. Get every piece of meat off of them. Oh, but do it after the restaurant's closed. Stay and do it, and I'm going to check your work in the morning. But that's how I learned how to butcher, you know? And I hated it. I hated it when I was a young culinary, and I hated that the chef, quote-unquote, made me do that, but I was... I did a good enough job that I was cutting meat at a fairly young age for my career, keep getting taught how to butcher. And then that chef, this is out in Long Island, he himself wasn't an expert butcher. He was kind of like me, you know, you get the job done. This is called whittling, but it's not a, it's not a good term. It's kind of a derogatory term. All right, let's take a look here. So this is that one piece of extra meat. Here's the other. You can see they're not very consistent. But if I weighed them, and they're, let's say they're both, I don't know, eight ounces, six ounces, or whatever, you know, I could trim this down a little bit, then yeah, maybe you can get a lunch steak out of that. So, I don't know. It's up to you. For those of you that are interested in cutting your own meat. And we get this a lot. I get this a lot. I, uh, when I teach cooking, I always bring my proteins pre-portioned, pre-cut, I don't want people touching chicken and contaminating everything, uh, or t touching meat and contaminating everything. So um, I am uh, very careful to have this kind of work done. But people say, well, I want to learn how to butcher. Okay. So when I've done private events, I bring, a, I bring one of these, and I bring my filet knife, and I bring some meat and cow out of the back, and most people are instantly grossed out. Like, oh, oh, we actually have to touch it with our bare hands? Yeah, you know, so kind of funny. Um, and I get it. I mean, when I was a young culinarian, the thought of, you know, the first time I had to touch raw chicken with my bare hands was, you know, it almost made me just throw up. But then it was described to us that, you know, that, and again, I just guessed at that cut and I guessed okay. Um, you know, there's no better tool for the job than 
these right here, your hands. Okay, so what did I end up with that I'm proud of? I've got two bull nose and two barrel center cut barrels. These are all gonna get cryovacked. These lunch steaks, these I'm gonna I'm gonna cryovac and freeze these whole like this, and then I will pull these out when I have oh, a cooking demo or something, um, or grilling demo, whatever. We're doing more and more of that kind of work these days. Um, my colleagues, sales colleagues over at Fine Lines, they have a big uh, contract that they're working on. Somebody's looking at maybe doing a mountain home and a home in town, plus a wine room, plus an outdoor kitchen. Oh, and by the way, like I need a walk and drive from my mother's house. Uh, and we're looking at $75,000 of appliances. Um, they will ask me to come and demo some appliances, bring some food, do a little cooking demo. I have a brunch coming up. Um, I don't know if I'll do this for brunch, but I'll do something. And so I always like to have some extra food kicking around. Um, you know, not that I'm like on a tight budget, but. I want to be extremely careful with my master's money. Uh, it's just good to have to get into. All right. Well, there we go. I'll cry back this. If you want to see how to cry back, I've got a ton of videos here on my YouTube channel. Plus the last week on my YouTube live, I cry back. Um, I don't think I had too many people tune in for this uh, live, but uh, I'm going to crack that nut. I'm going to keep trying. So, uh, but of course this will be posted up uh for you guys to watch if you missed it. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. If there's anything you want to see me do live, let me know. This is Chef Mark. I'm in the laboratory cutting meat. Hope you have a great day.